Morning, EGP learners, and welcome to this episode of the EGP Learning Podcast with myself, Dr. St. Gandhi, and... And uh, Dr. Andy Foster, over here in another part of Nottingham, socially distanced, yeah. by a few yes, kilometres. definitely. Yes, um, and we're coming to you today talking about a rather interesting topic that we kind of wanted to talk about earlier, but other things took over, like the COVID vaccination enhanced service. And if you do want to check out our comments on that, feel free to look at our other episodes, and I'm sure there'll be links down below so you could do that. But today we wanted to talk about something that I feel is often neglected in general practice and that's the safety you know how can you actually stay safe in general practice and I don't know that this got prompted by some recent things that have happened in the in the public and things um and in particular there was a recent issue with one of our colleagues um who had um to be honest a rather unsettling experience in their practice uh, or around their practice and stuff um and that's dr shabanabi um who basically had some real challenges didn't she andy um yeah shall we so uh, so there was an article in impulse so shabba shabba writes often um uh, some editorial in, impulse um yep. really interesting stuff um but she'd uh, recently had a, a really bad um experience with graffiti at her practice um it, it's actually a really nice article because she she first talks about um how she's had a lot of support from the community and actually felt very safe within the community in which she works uh, but unfortunately and um, uh, those with sensibilities to rude words can look away um, mm. but her colleagues arrived at the surgery uh, one morning recently and there was uh, graffiti um, on the the side of their surgery um, which and actually I think I don't know what you think Andy but this is actually quite cutting graffiti because um, mm -hmm. I think it sort of cuts to the heart of um, of where GPs are quite vulnerable and doctors in general, really, because um, most of us are in the profession, at least on some level, to uh, to help people um, and to listen to people and um, to try and give people time. So actually, that sort of graffiti, whilst you think you know people could say much worse, um, it's actually quite cutting. I think you know telling people that they don't care essentially um, is actually mm -hmm. quite. Um, quite distressing really for doctors to hear um i don't know what you think about that gandhi i agree and i think unfortunately it comes at a time where uh, i know general practice morale is not great let's be honest uh, at times we found it really challenging we're we're 10 months into the biggest you know challenge that general practice has ever felt in terms of the pandemic and obviously across the country and the world many people are still struggling to deal with the impact of what you know covid has done to us um, but in general practice, you know, there's a lot of false rhetoric going around that adds to this in terms of, you know, the, the fact that people say that we've been shut. Let's be clear, general practice has never been shut throughout this whole thing. In fact, we've done more and more um, over the time. There's been times where both you and I have worked bank holidays when we wouldn't normally have done so to make sure that we provide a care and service to our patients. Uh, and having stuff like this, I, I mean, th this is obviously a stark reminder of some of the the emotion that's out there but even you know we get have increased issues with complaints comments all that kind of stuff which is generated by stuff that's beyond our control let's be, let's be honest about that yeah. um and it, so it hurts really, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a really really unpleasant but i think this got us thinking more generally about safety um at work um and in mm -hmm. and as a gp and as someone who works in a gp surgery um, in general, and I agree with your opening comments, Candy. That I think it's something that we are not very good at at all. And I think actually, the the um, the sort of closer you get towards the partners at GP surgeries, I think the worse we are at it. Actually, mm -hmm. and uh, those of us who are partners are probably <laughs> the worst in terms of looking after our personal safety. Um, mm -hmm. And I think actually, having reflected, there's some changes that we need to sort of make <laughs> make at my surgery really, or just put things in place again that we've tried before. But I'm sure yeah. we'll get to all of these. We'll get to all of these things. Um, yeah. So, what were what what were your thoughts on safety, or how do you want to tackle this, Gandhi? Well, I think it's something that we often neglect in general practice, like you say, because we don't think about it, and we kind of hope that our patients are generally supportive, and that our risks and that kind of stuff are are fairly minimal in terms of what we need to be concerned or worried about. Um, I think Shaba puts it quite clearly in in one part of it, where she talks about the fact that she works in a an area that is not always considered one of the best places necessarily to be in the safest areas to be but very much that you know um in terms of the the practice the patients have always been supportive and and even to a sense almost protect the, the practice in terms of making because you know 
you know, doing something aggressive to your doctor is not a great thing to do because they're there to help you. They're there to help not only you, but that your family in terms of the patients, the community and that kind of stuff in terms of their health care. Uh, and very much, you know, both you and I work in, in similar areas in inner city, you know, fairly deprived. And there are definitely, you know, safety issues that, that need to be acknowledged. And as a result of that, you know, I've always felt that where I work, you know, the, the patients are on the whole generally very respectful uh, and you know there is an element of recognizing that you know we're there to help the community uh, and that hopefully affords us some element of support and protection from the community but i think you know things do happen and you need to be aware of the fact that things can happen um i know one of the things i i do is i, I generally try and make myself look fairly inconspicuous when i go on home visits and stuff because i don't want people to think that i might be carrying medications or, or you know things that could be taken from me and being aware of that when i go on home visits and stuff you know that, that's something i've always been very clear to and particularly with the trainees that i look after you know I, I do warn them that they work in an area of the city that you know it's it's not sensible to just kind of do go out and do what you want kind of thing you do have to be mindful that there are risks in, in where you're working that's interesting Andy. see I, I i go the other way a little bit in terms of my appearance so i'm i'm probably doing the wrong thing but um um but it's interesting what shabba said about i think um often communities even deprived ones consider their gp as a sort of a, a community resource in a way you know in something mm. um that actually um uh, she was talking about um being told that people will you know watch her car and you know once they you know if they they know that she's the gp she'll get a little bit of um protection even from the local community and and i uh, you know i've got a very classic looking doctor's bag you know i tend to um dress like a typical gp when i'm going around and um i think actually sometimes if people uh, feel that you're a health professional the local gp then actually you get a bit more of a free pass um or less hassle than if you mm -hmm. don't. So I, I sometimes lean the other way. Although there is the issue of of the, the minority of people thinking that you might be carrying um, some uh, some interesting uh, drugs or supplies, uh, which mm -hmm. which we generally don't do actually. An ambulance is always eight minutes away, so we don't carry. Uh, if anyone sees me out and about, I don't carry opiates. Um, so uh, ditto. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the beauty of being being urban, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. Opiates in its way so yeah so shall we break this so safety is an interesting topic actually um and and as of ever we're um we're systematic uh scientific people so it might be helpful to break break it down to the different areas and sort of just talk through our own personal experiences of how we um try and keep safe and any sort of hints and tips mm -hmm. for the people um so um i think the most risky area that's going to come foremost to people's minds uh, is that of home visits so when we leave mm -hmm. the surgery and the comfort there and all of our staff and we go and visit someone in their own home um and we often go there alone um and uh i don't know about your surgery candy but we we sometimes end up doing a, a late or an evening home visit if it's something you've mm -hmm. not been in at lunchtime and i think that's probably the highest sort of risk absolutely activity that we that we do as gps actually because uh, you're not going back to the surgery and there isn't necessarily unless you put a process in place anyone who's going to know if you don't go home or you don't um you know go, obviously sure. you, a, a lot of people might not have people at home who might not notice if they don't go home as well so yeah yeah so yeah how do you how do you um try and limit your risks around home visits candy so I'd, I'd like to think we're reasonably good at this because we've had um, challenges where people have been threatened when they've been on home visits and stuff in the past um so as a result of that obviously when those kind of things happen you think about it and you put things in place to try and prevent it from happening again so for example when people go on a home visit we have a um, sheet on the board that says that the person's gone to visit this person what time they've left and what time they anticipate coming back and if you know the idea being that if they're not then somebody one of the receptionists just checks the board normally around about lunchtime to see if people have or haven't signed themselves back in um and then obviously if it's not then the, there's a, a round robin just to check that they're back and that they're safe and, and that kind of stuff um, and that generally works it clearly has a couple of flaws so if you forget to mark it on the board if you forget to remind you know mark it that you're back if the reception team gets so bogged down because of the the calls and stuff they forget to check there, there are definitely some challenges with that but at least it's something we hope to try and put in to safeguard people as best as possible and i think the other part as well is doing a risk assessment you know before you go out and do the visit itself you know that that should 
be happening. There's not only the element of does that actually need a visit is the first thing, but that's a clinical decision. But then if there is potential concerns that we're aware of with doing that home visit, then you do need to do a risk assessment before you actually go out and do the visit and understand, you know, what that may entail. And um, I know you've had some thoughts about certain things that's worth asking about. I know there's one that I always, always ask a new patient I've never been to about, and that's dogs, because yeah. you and I know my my view on dogs and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I know you, you put that one down, didn't you? Yeah, dogs. I, you, see, I, you see, I love dogs and I've got a dog myself, um, but I think they are they are risky, particularly little ones. They're often um, not so well behaved. Um, I've never been bitten, but I've been in, I remember one um, home visit where it was a lady who was bed, bed, bed bound um, in a, you know, in a sort of hospital style bed, not palliative care, but she was bed bound and she had um, a small dog and it was really, really pr- protective of her and I was trying to examine her because that's what I needed to do. And the dog was jumping up and snapping at me. Um, so yeah, if there's, I, I, and what I should have done with retrospect is can I put your dog in a different room while we do mm-hmm. this? But I just didn't think to do that at the time, but yeah, but ask them if they've got a dog and can they, you know, lock the dog away. Often patients are quite good uh, with this, but sometimes they're not. So that's worth doing. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing I'll say again is, I mean, Something we we do not regularly, but where we're aware that there might be an issue with a patient being violent or it's not always violence, is it? Sometimes people might make um, false allegations and, you know, things like mm-hmm. that. There's other ways that GPs or healthcare professionals are vulnerable. Um, but we will sometimes um, take another member of staff with us. I know I've sometimes mm-hmm. taken, you know, a, a receptionist or deputy manager or gone with a nurse um, or something like that. And I think that's that can be something that's really, really helpful if you, it, it's resource intensive, but if you've got a high level mm-hmm. of concern, then so, I suppose, I mean, the, the job of keeping people safe becomes, it comes even before that risk assessment on the day, doesn't it? And it's mm-hmm. about capturing and documenting where there are concerns. So I know on the front screen of patients notes that we have a few patients where um, they might've been known to carry weapons, for example, um, mm-hmm. or people have had previous issues um, in the home sometimes it's staff with certain demographics so sometimes it can be female staff or um or people with other uh, with other demographics you know sometimes people of different race and things like that it can unfortunately be an issue uh sometimes it's men you know who who can have Mm -hmm. an issue going to places for for other or similar reasons so you know good documentation it starts with that i think absolutely Uh, document risks and then do the risk assessment maybe take someone with you sort out dogs um do any planning that you can let people know where you are. But Gandhi, when you're there, have you got any tips? So when you're, when you're actually there, we, cause we don't always know in advance that things might be tricky. Um, what do you do to keep no, yourself don't. during a visit? So one of the things that I do for all visits is that I triage every single visit I go for and no matter what the reason may be, if, unless it's somebody I know very, very well. And that I know that I, I'm aware of the, the elements and you know the, the outcomes of whether I do or don't need to visit so clinically there's that element but like you said I have a process I go through so I'll ask the person how do I get into the property because that's often important particularly if it's somebody housebound and sorry bed bound um, and they can't open the door well, how, how are you going to actually get into the property if they can't open the door so, so you know simple things like because it's frustrating when you get there and you realize you can't get in that that's an annoying thing um, I also ask about dogs and pets um because um so uh, unlike andy i'm not a big fan of dogs to be honest um i am not yeah i'm happy to be around them and when we've recorded andy's um andy has a dog as he mentioned and you know J- jeff and me have an interesting relationship don't we andy <laughs> in, yeah, in yeah we respect works. each other from a distance i think that's what i'd say yeah <laughs> so i'll say to the patients you know it, it, you know do you have an, a pet or a, and you know if they tell me that they've got a dog and stuff i'll say well can you please make sure that the the pet is put away before i get to the property so i can um, assess you and things because uh, and I make it clear that I won't come into the house unless that's done because uh, for me it, it it puts me on a different psychological basis as well and I'm aware then I may not be able to function effectively um, so you know and I think there needs to be that acknowledgement that not everybody likes particular things you know and there may even be a health element so I know you know for example if you've got clinicians with asthma you know if pets dander and that kind of stuff or, or smoking is the other one triggers that then those clinicians are putting themselves at potential health risk 
Um, so we're not just talking about physical safety from violence, but also talk about health safety and things. You know, is that something that needs to be discussed? So, you know, I'll say to patients, you know, if they're smoking, can you please put that out? Because actually it makes my breathing a little bit harder and I, I don't, you know, that's not safe for me. We're always taught in a medical situation, actually the priority is always your own safety, because if you're not safe, then you can't do anything. Um, so, yeah, I have that process of calling the patient, making sure I've assessed things as best as I can. If there's going to be other people around, um, when I visit as well, because that's useful for me to know, both in terms of understanding the situation and also understanding what I'm walking into as well. Um, and I guess that's one of the ones that did prompt things for us when we changed our policies, whereby it wasn't actually the patient that was the issue. It was um, a patient's relative that got quite aggressive to one of our staff members and almost locked them into the house. And, you know, it was almost like a hostage situation to a degree because they refused to let the clinician leave um, the premises because... Uh, and to be clear, that relative had some mental health issues, but um, you know that that was a situation that clinician clearly did not feel safe in, and did the right thing, which was left immediately, and contacted us and, and things. Um, but you know, it's being aware of who else is around so that you can make that risk assessment. And I do that before I go out and visit. I guess the issue, like I said, of then what do you do? Yeah bit more tricky as you said once once you're there and something untoward comes in and and the, the best answer i can give is simply you leave you know that that is often the safest thing to do if you are concerned about your safety your safety is paramount in those situations because you can't help somebody if you yourself feel unsafe um and the first thing that would be to would be to try and leave and clear if that's being prevented and to be honest the answer is to call the police yeah, I think I think I think you're right. I think leave and and, and leave early, really. Um, you mm. know, if if you're um, getting a sense that things are not going in the in the right direction, then I think it's with with you know getting out of there once you know there isn't an acute medical situation and you're feeling that things are going south and not going well. Then just 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 leave early. You know, reestablish communication via the telephone. Um, and you know, people should understand if you do not feel comfortable and you leave. You know, there is nothing wrong with that at all you know um and 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 actually any reasonable person or reasonable family should understand that um yeah so and i think you're right and i think around home visits i think th this is where the process is most key and what i'm interested in is so we have the board where we um where we sort of say where we're going and, and when we're back mm -hmm. and so forth now where i've always worried about this is around the evening visits issue mm -hmm. and it tends to be more the partners that do them um mm -hmm. And um, and we sort of have a we, we we have an agreement that we'll we'll let each other know on the WhatsApp, you know, if we're if we're doing one and we'll check back in. But that always feels a little bit um, haphazard. And I'm not sure that we always do it. I don't know. Have you, have you guys got a robust um, system ar ar around it? Um, so it depends on your definition of robust. I mean, we use yeah. a similar process. So normally if somebody is having to do a late visit, we would say that you speak to one of the other people that are already in practice um, who, you know, may still be there. Because normally, you know, if you're having to do a late visit before you actually have to do it. Um, and so, you know, I've had situations where, or, or where I've been on either side of this where I've said to the person, mm -hmm. I've got to go do a late visit. Um, uh, I anticipate I should be done by about... You know, I, I tend to go at the end of my clinic, so I'll say I should be done by about seven. Um, I'll contact you around about seven o'clock uh, just to let you know that I've left the property and that I'm on my way home or I'm on my way back to the practice or whatever. Um, and I've done similar with other colleagues if they've had to go out and do visits, you know, when they've said, I'm going on a visit, and I said, fine, well, message me. What time do you think you'll be done by? Um, and then, you know, it's just letting somebody else, that's the key thing, having some sort of contact and saying that actually, I want this check. And, and if they haven't contacted me, then I'll ring them and I'll say, is everything okay? And, and touch wood, thankfully, we've never had a situation where it's been something negative has happened. There have been times when people have forgotten. Um, and so, I, you know, I've, I remember once where one of my colleagues went out to do a visit. He, he forgot to, to message me. So I called him back and he was actually still in the consultation. It was just, he, he was, it was still going on. And he was like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. So I said, fine, I'll call you back in 10 minutes just to make sure you've left. Um, and yeah, it was fine after that. So yeah, team, I think teamwork. Know, yeah, teamwork. Team, it, it, is, it is teamwork and stuff. And, you know, I, I think there are potentially tech solutions that can help with this. So I know there's things like in you know, apps and stuff that can help to geolocations and that kind of thing to s suggest where you may be. But the key things, they only work if you actually use them, first of all. 
And secondly, they just generally alert, lead to awareness of a problem. They don't prevent the issue from happening. The thing that prevents them from happening is the risk assessment and it's that element of things. And if I may, I'll give you an example of this. So um, I had a patient that we had many challenges with discussing with um, in terms of the patient had mental health issues and was quite aggressive um, on contact with the phone and had made several threats um, to multiple members of staff. So not just myself. Um, and clearly this, this person was unwell. There was no question on that. And um, we wanted to have the support of the mental health team involved with this patient. Um, and one of their requirements was that somebody had to physically assess him first. Now, the problem I had with that is that this was a patient that already made several um, threats and, and allegations and, and, you know, verbal and, you know, quite clearly commented that he would put physical violence on anybody from the practice that came to visit him. So I clearly wasn't happy to go and visit this person physically. Um, and I was aware of some of the history as well, potentially, that made me just a bit more unsettled. So I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to do that. He's personalised his threats towards our practice and to myself. Um, there's no one else that can clinically go out and do this. Um, so I genuinely feel he's physically, you know, not physically, so he's mentally unwell and, and needs further support. And I think we are looking at you know, things like sectioning and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but I have no intention of visiting this person face to face to put myself in that situation. And even taking a second person with me, I, I knew that actually that was still going to be unsafe because it was personalized to us. It wasn't to other people. It was to mm -hmm. the practice. It was to myself and one other colleague and, and team. So, you know, I didn't feel that was a safe thing to do. Um, they suggested taking the police with me. Well, I spoke to the police already and they felt that actually um, that wasn't something they could support us with. And it wasn't an immediate threat because it wasn't a guaranteed threat. OK, fair enough. That, that's their view. So I just simply said I wasn't prepared to do it. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't prepared to put myself in that situation. And I know that there'll probably be some people out there saying that, you know, you should always put the patient first. I agree. But not at the expense of your own safety. That, that's the key thing the, you know a situation where the patient um you know is violent towards um health professionals is not is not good for the patient no. either you know if, if if there's not an immediate threat to you know to, to life or something in which case you would call an ambulance then um then you know that's not good for for their life and the progress of their life either so i think i think you're right to look for other solutions sounds like the relationship had broken down there gandhi so um mm -hmm. I suspect that they might have been exploring a relationship with a new GP, you know, in pretty short order after that, I guess. Well, I can't give much more detail because I think it yeah. will make it more identifiable. But what I will say is that the outcomes of that made me feel that actually the decision I made was the best one overall because of what happened afterwards. Um, but, you know, um, all I can say is that it was the right decision, although it meant that things took a bit longer. Um, but it was the safest decision that was made in retrospect now that we know about what happened afterwards. So, yeah. So, so Gandhi, I'd like to talk next about, um, about safety in the surgery. Now mm -hmm. it's interesting because I think we feel that home visits are the highest risk, but you know where I've had the most trouble it's in surgery, basically. Mm -hmm. There are a few reasons for that. And I think people that we, we do fewer home visits. So statistically, you know, we're less likely to experience an issue because we're doing fewer of them. And also, I think the demographics of the people who get who get home visits from us, they tend to be more frail, mm -hmm. they tend to be older, they tend to have long-term health conditions. Yeah. I think in a way, those people are less likely um, to have issues and problems with healthcare professionals. So the surgery mm -hmm. is where I've had the most issues, I think. Um, and just thinking systematically just to I, th I think some of the principles we identified for for home visits is, is, are still really relevant for in in the clinic um it's important that where there are issues or potential issues with patients that they're documented um and that's really really helpful and actually what i find um because that's sharing intelligence isn't it about the patient with the team and actually in surgery what i often find is uh, the receptionist will send me a message or knock on my door and they'll say uh, this person's just booked in um, and I know from their home screen that they um, have X, Y, or Z issues, or they've had issues mm. uh, being violent or demanding um, or manipulative at the practice before. And I wanted to give you a heads up. And I think that's fantastic. Thanks very mm -hmm. much. That's great teamwork. Or sometimes they've been aggressive when booking the appointment or um, at the desk when they've been booking in and they just pass on that intel. And, and sometimes they'll say, do you want someone with you, Dr. Foster? You know, do you want mm -hmm. me to wait outside the door? 
um, and if there's a commotion, come in. So, uh, so I think that that intel, um, that help from your colleagues is really, really helpful. So it's really good if you work in an environment like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any further thoughts or or move us through the process, Andy? Yeah, I think there's definitely an element of having the awareness and that team approach um, in terms of what's happened. And if there have been conflicts, then, then noting it and, and sharing that information. I think it is also important that sometimes you don't make pre-assumptions based on that as well. So I, I completely understand, you know, patients often have frustrations with how booking of an appointment may work and that kind of stuff. And that is often presented in one way. And then when they come to see us, we get a completely different picture or different information and, and you know, different situation. That, that kind of colors in a different direction. Um, so I think having the information is useful, but don't just purely rely on the information itself um, because it's a perspective at the end of the day um, and perspective changes. But I think, you know, repeat elements absolutely need to be identified. And if there is significant stuff, so, you know, personalized um, aggression, that absolutely needs to be challenged. Um, direct threats need to absolutely be recognized and challenged. And, you know, just why is this happening as well? So, so often I, in those kind of situations, I'll, I'll discuss it with the patient after we've done the consultation. Look, uh, I understand there's some conflict here. What happened? Why did that happen? You know, is it something we've done wrong, which may be the issue? Um, is it actually something the patient needs to recognize as a problem? Because otherwise it can lead to habits and that's what you don't want. So it's about being open and honest about conflict as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. And also, it's important that we're holistic practitioners. Uh, and actually, there's been a few occasions where the receptionist said, oh, this person was, you know, they've been quite aggressive or assertive at the desk, just want to give you a head up. And I'd say, well, actually, we are aware as a practice that they've had a recent bereavement or very mm -hmm. difficult circumstances. Um, that's probably why they were like that at, at the desk. Um, but thanks for giving me a heads up. So, um, mm -hmm. so often there are other reasons as well. So, it's it's important to recognise that. Um, so um, yeah. So what's your what's your process at the surgery then? So you um, talk me through what happens. So you, you think there might be an issue with a patient. So you know what 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 do you do or put in place? What's the processes there? Well, I think the first thing that needs to be aware of is the room setup that you have. So you know, good practice is actually that the clinician is towards the door, um, so that if there was an issue, that you can just leave and leave safely. Um, uh, and, you know, so you're not having to get past the patient that could be blocking your door. Because that, that's one of the worst situations, isn't it? That you're, you're stuck in a room with somebody that's being, per, you know, potentially aggressive and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things you mentioned was about sometimes we're aware that sometimes patients carry weapons. Um, I think if that's the situation, then, uh, you know, um, I will make sure that we check with the patient. First of all, are they carrying anything? Because if they are, then to be honest, that's a safety risk. And that needs to be discussed and mentioned and tackled. You know, not just, okay, yeah, so you're carrying a weapon, fine, come into the room kind of thing. We're, we're going to ignore that fact. Um, but then, you know, is it that the door has to be open? Is it that there has to be a second person in the room for safety? Is it that actually we need to arrange this at a time that's more appropriate? Um, you know, and is, it different, is there a different way of handling this? You know, is it remote consultation is actually the better use of appointment mechanisms here rather than a face-to-face? -face? And if it has to be a face-to-face, -face, what happens there? Um, and I, I think then it's that question of, also being aware that if things are becoming conflicted, you know, in the sense there is aggression or this stuff building, knowing how to resolve that, having just some simple, recognizing that you don't get stuck into that cycle um, and feed into it uh, and actually, you know, do you need to take a breather? Do you need to pause the consultation? Do you need to, you know, change tack? Do you need to even not be you? Because sometimes it is you that's the issue. Um, and you know how how can you resolve that? and having some awareness of those so you know people sometimes bemoan about mandatory training and stuff but one of the ones i do recommend everybody does is conflict resolution training because it can actually be quite useful to be honest um and it's one of those ones that you hope never to use but if you have to use it you know being aware of the issues and understanding it is really important yeah i'd agree i, I think the training's helpful i think also the conversations that i had as a as a trainee and and also post trainee with people following having difficult situations um, and the, the tips and tactics and um, and the information that I got in those situations when I was really ready and had a need to improve, those were really, really, 
really helpful. Um, probably more so than than your sort of standard training, really. Um, but I think it, you know, learning from other people's experience and just going through experiences yourself and reflecting um, can mm -hmm. be really can be really really helpful as well. So, um, is there any experience that you learned from Gandhi? Um, um, I, I mean, there's been a couple of occasions. Too specific, but... Yeah, I mean, there's been a couple of occasions where, unfortunately, there has been conflict in the consultation. And like I said, one of the best ones I've used is, I'm really sorry, it's clear that we're not moving forward here. I'm going to suggest we take a brief pause um, and we come back to it just to, you know, relax. So, you know, just a minute or so, let's just take a breather. Um, there have been a couple of times where I've had to terminate the consultation. I've just said, look, we're just not getting any further before this gets somewhere else. Um, let's just stop and we'll, we will, you know, I can either, I'm happy to book you with somebody else um, if that's the best option, or we can, again, start this up later on. You know, I can call you back and, and I've done everything I need to do if it's a face to face and that kind of stuff. Um, and we can discuss the outcomes of this a bit later on. Um, I do remember one time where a patient um, threatened me with physical violence um, because I refused to do a referral um, because clinically I couldn't, it just wasn't something I could do. Um, and even though I was trying to show them that actually I wasn't able to do it because for various reasons, um, they, they just felt that I was being obstructive and, and I, you know, even me showing the guidance, even me showing the local processes and the reasons why I couldn't do it. Um, you know, they, they're just like, well, no, you do it or I'm going to hit you. And I was like, sorry, we're stopping here. Now, I was fortunate. I, I actually had somebody else in the room that time because I actually had a medical student and that was their first exposure to general practice. So that was a telling thing. Um, but, you know, that, that was the time where I've just said, look, I, I think we end this consultation. He didn't want to leave. So I was like, fine, well, then, then I'm leaving. So I, I left the room. Plain and simple, I took the medical student with me and we left the room. Yeah, I've, and, done, I've, done, I've done that before. Yeah. Uh, and that was, uh, in my view, that was the safest thing to do. Um, and then, you know, eventually about 30 seconds later, he left the room as well because he realized nothing else was happening. Um, and, you know, I, I had one of my colleagues call him up later um, just to discuss the, the situation and I said I was happy to discuss it with him as well. But that would be by telephone um, just because of the threat he made. Um, and, you know, we even sent him a written warning. Um, and, we didn't actually go down the route of informing the police because I felt there was other things, but like I said, he had a written warning. It was made very clear if it happened again, then we would inform the police. Yeah. Because I, th I think there does need to be that element of if situations get to the point where reason goes out the window and personalized threats are made, the police need to be involved. It's, yeah, that, it's not safe know, to accept that. Yeah. That was, that was going to be part of my next point really actually is, mm -hmm. um, zero tolerance um, policies are important that certain mm. things are not tolerated and, and to the extent that if certain things happen then you know the practice will call the police you know to get support mm. um, yeah I'm just thinking of a uh, an experience I had it's always uh, when you start talking um, you can think of all sorts can't you but uh, I can remember a, a consultation that that um, didn't go well and I won't go into um, into the, the details because I want to sort of be identifying but um but you know you leave the room the person follows you into the corridor and then mm -hmm. they uh, shout at you spit in your face um you know even sort of pick up chairs and, th and throw them at you this is probably the worst sort of situation mm -hmm. i had um and uh, it was interesting how it, sometimes you you just have to keep yourself and the staff safe and, and the team has yep. to just respond and just uh, deal with it. So in those situations, you just have to, you know, keep a calm and steady voice, try your best to calm the person down mm -hmm. and resolve the situation. Um, other people, you know, heard what was going on. So we're around and did the same thing. And, you know, we just had to call security, call the police, let the person know that the police was on the way. And, you know, at that point, the person left, um, you know, the building. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes I don't want to put people off careers in general practice. That's only ever happened once. Um, and, and what was surprising about it was I actually um, felt very supported by uh, mm -hmm. by the practice and actually by the police who did respond and did come and did take statements. And they did go and talk to the person 
afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so actually, overall, I felt I felt really reassured. Um, that leads me on to my next point, which I think is when something actually quite significant happens, or even small things, because small things can be really upsetting for mm-hmm. uh, for clinicians of, of any level of experience. I think it's really important to have a good debrief. I'm sure you guys yeah. do this, you know, as a practice as well. But just think, what happened? What went well? about that because often things do go well when you deal with a difficult situation in a practice um you know what what could have gone better and also is everyone okay and does anyone have any pastoral needs afterwards you know and, and I know when things have gone people have had some some really rough consultations we've often uh, pitched in and seen the rest of their patients and let, let them you know not yep. do very much for the rest of their um for the rest of their clinic because they've been so shook up so just debrief and and look after each other i guess would be would be something Agreed. Else. What happens afterwards. and i think that process needs to be there and, that, and that's not just for your regular staff but you know um obviously many practices have locums they, they may have that experience you know understanding and supporting them um when that happens i mean ho- hopefully touch wood it shouldn't do but if it does it's recognizing that you know people have needs and and you know a, de- a debrief is a really good way of just trying to understand what went wrong. And, e- and even if that then turns into something like a learning event, was there something bigger that needs to be looked at into why that happened? I mean, I, I would probably suggest any conflict that ends up in that situation where the patient has to leave or where the consultation is terminated or you know threats are made that there should be a learning event analysis done from it. That's just kind of like my, my trainer hat on and stuff, I think, because that, that's a sensible way to understand why did it get to that stage was it that it was practice factors? Was it clinician factors? Was it patient factors? You know, what was what was it a combination of all three? But what, why did that happen and how can we prevent it? Yeah. Um, but I, I know the one that I remember, and I think it speaks to two elements. Um, so one was um, a trainee of ours who unfortunately had got, um, was in a room with a patient with, again, mental health issues who was being unfortunately very, very aggressive verbally. Um, and I know we give patients a lot of latitude when that happens, like you said, bereavement situations, that kind of stuff, you know, th- there's a bit more latitude that's given. But, you know, she got to a point where she was feeling very intimidated by the patient um, and, and she left the room. Um, and I, I was her trainer. Unfortunately, I didn't find out till the end of clinic. So although she notified other people, as a, you know, the person who's meant to be supporting, I, I didn't find out till clinic was over and I went to debrief and I was like, oh, OK, no, I, I wasn't aware that this had happened. Um, so, you know, to me, that was an element of um, being supportive. And, you know, I kind of gave her, uh, just said to her, look, just take the rest of the day off. You know, she was still quite shook up about it. You know, clearly wasn't able to focus and concentrate. So not in the best place to be. We debriefed about what happened and how it happened and everything else and what we needed to do to try and make her feel happy and also deal with the patient in terms of, both health issues and also the issues of what got to that. But the one that stuck out to me, which I think is probably one thing we should talk about, is how to actually notify your colleagues. Um, you know, so if something is going wrong, how, what do you do? <laughs> um, because that was the part that I think was, and that was the thing that came out of the learning event analysis, that what would have been more useful at that situation was that, that she had actually notified the practice that this was happening. And there are different ways you can do that. There's different systems you can use. Um, system one has a shortcut that allows you to send a message to everybody in the practice saying that something's going wrong and i know many of us use that for clinical things but actually for this kind of stuff as well is perfectly sensible to use i think it's control shift control alt and delete is it or control i can't remember the shortcut i was just thinking i was going to ask you what's the what's the thing because you almost karate chop the keyboard don't you and i think you go like control shift return or something like that and it discreetly lets other people know that there's an issue because whenever i'm Whenever I'm, I forgot what, what the keystroke is now, but whenever I'm inducting a, a student or someone and I'm doing my little brief, I, I always do it as a test to see if mm-hmm. anybody comes to my room to help me. And generally they do. So that's, yeah. so that's good. Um, I think it's control, really- alt and delete, but do check on system. If you go on system one on the toolbar, if you go for the panic button thing, it's got the shortcut written next to it. But I think the issue with that is that it's a keyboard shortcut and you have to remember to press the right keys at the right time. You still have to actively do it. Um, so. I was keen to try and find out if there's other solutions around that could help. And and I know in terms of my investigating, um, so not recommending this at all, but it's just something I've heard of. It's something called the little green button. 
So it's a website. Um, it's used by a couple of practices, and and the colleague I spoke to that mentioned about this said that you know that they've had this um, supported for them by their health board. Um, in terms of payment for it, so there is a cost. I think it's in like uh, five hundred pounds or something for up to twenty members of staff. Um, it's an electronic system that kind of sits like um, the System One awareness button, but you also get. Uh, let's put it on screen, shall we? Then Andy, because see you doing that. I've got the pricing screen. Uh, yeah, okay. there we go. So um, that's an electronic version. But what they also do is something called their big green button, which is a hardware button. So it's like a little green fob, and if you have an issue, you just slam the button. So it's a lot quicker, a lot easier to do. And I do like the concept of that, to be honest, having something physical that you can just press and, and you know, um, even if it's discreet, you know, uh, uh, many clinic rooms may have, you know, um, aware alarm buttons that, you know, silent alarm buttons and stuff. I know our practice does also have those. So we do have um, a little bit, but unfortunately mine in my room is behind the monitor. It's the worst placement for it. I was going to say the same thing. It's sort of it's behind the label printer in the corner of the monitor, and I always mm. make a little joke of it actually when when I'm doing my induction to new medical staff. As, as yeah. how it's they you'll find them. They're generally behind everything uh, and mm. hard to get to, but um, uh, but they're there. Which I mean, we we should try and resolve that. But it's difficult because there's so much stuff that needs to go on a desk, and these buttons are just in the place where everything is. Um, yeah. So oh, yeah, others. So additional solutions, uh, not no, no bad thing that those are available. Um, mm. Yeah. So, um, Gandhi, there's so there's some other areas. I think we've covered sure. the, the main risk areas, but uh, there are some other areas where I know I've 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 had an issue, and this is around going to the car <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, okay. Because often you work you work late, don't you? And mm. um, and sometimes you're one of the last people out of the building. You know, as a as a GP and as a GP partner. And uh, and actually, that can feel like one of the most vulnerable times. Um, so sometimes if you've had a bit of conflict earlier in the day, you can think, I wonder if that person, they know my car, they know my working patterns. What if they mm -hmm. come back and get me? So um, so we we have a bit of a policy as if people have had a, a difficult day, we'll often ask security. We're, we're fortunate enough to be in a lift building and we have security. And um, I've had security walk me, walk me to my car uh, before because mm -hmm. I felt jittery after having difficult conversations or consultations. So that's an area where I've had issues. And I was going to tell you an anecdote because this is quite funny and speaks to a bit of what Shabba was saying as well um, mm -hmm. about bad things can happen, but also the community can be quite supportive of general practice. So there was one evening where I'd worked late and I was, I was walking out to my car and um, some, uh, some, I'll call them youths, so young people, um, were sort of walking away from where my car was parked and they walked past me. And I generally don't, you know, I know a lot, you know, the young people sort of know who I am and things like that. So I don't feel threatened by walking past young people. But anyway, as they walk past, they sort of whisper, oh, it's Dr. Foster, it's Dr. Foster's car. And then, I um, don't know if you heard that, they were whispering about, oh, it's Dr. Foster's car. And then when I got to my car, I found that it was, it was covered in footprints and the aerial had been yanked off the top. Um, and um, and then just a few minutes later, while I was assessing the damage, obviously they'd done something to my car, I was assessing the damage to my car, um, a police car actually came and said, oh, you know, is this your car? Um, actually, some of the people overlooking have, have rang and said that there was an issue um, with uh, some people vandalizing the car. Um, and but and they'd arrived within minutes. Um, mm -hmm. And then we had a look at the security footage um, because it's a, uh, there's some um, cameras in the car park and these uh, these young people had been jumping up and down on on top of my car and had broke the aerial of and were waving it around and it's like, what are they doing these young people um and it was quite cheap to remedy so i don't really hold grudges but what was interesting about that was that they'd recognized me in and i think they were a bit regretful that they'd vandalized my car rather than someone mm -hmm. else's car don't know whether that should make me feel better or not. Um, but actually, people in and around the practice had, had rang the police. The police had come really, really quickly. Um, and actually, again, I felt quite supported by by the community and by our mm. police colleagues and things. So that was just an interesting anecdote. But why do youths do these things? They'll get themselves in trouble. It's not good for their lives. Anyway, Probably not a sensible thing to do it in a CCT area either. Um, yeah, and I guess that's... That that's something for practice to consider. You know, it, we are now living in the modern age of technology and, you know, abilities for this kind of stuff to happen. Is that something that, you know, if you don't have those kind of services in your building, is that something that actually from a safety perspective may need to be considered? 
Yeah, and cheap, and cheaper than ever as well, Gandhi. Yeah. The, the, these are not expensive solutions anymore. Uh, these these are cheap things to do and put in place. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're going to have a CCT monitoring system for various, you know, like five or six touch points with cameras and that kind of stuff. Twenty four hour recording. You're talking a couple of hundred quid or so. It's not that you know you don't have to have the monitored systems. You don't have you know you may want to. Fine, they obviously are more expensive, but you know. Um, just capturing that information, which is quite useful. Um, yeah, it's not the most expensive thing in the world unless you're having loads and loads of touch points and things. But I guess that, that raises another one that you mentioned that, um, um, that is worth possibly thinking about, and that's safety of your belongings in practice. I mean, how many times have we heard about clinicians having their, their purse or the keys stolen from their room or, or, you know, that kind of stuff? So it's being aware that whilst we would like to think our patients are generally, you know, um, helpful uh, and things the reality is there are somewhere that's not the case um you know i've had colleagues in my building where they've found out that their phone's been stolen from their bag when they went out to go get a sample pot for a patient or you know uh, when they've gone to do something and, and something's gone missing you know it happens that is the reality unfortunately of the world that we live in and one of the places where that can be useful is obviously internal cctv to understand what's happened and that kind of stuff and it's one of the things you, you hope never to have to use it, but when you kind of need it, it's there, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, very true. Yeah. So there's one more area. It feels like I've um, it feels like I'm very unfortunate actually now, <laughs> just thinking about <laughs> all these issues. Um, maybe I'm a bit of a target. Um, there's one area that I thought was interesting to consider, just because it's a, it's a really interesting anecdote, not something that I sort of felt vulnerable to through my work, um, but that's around. Um, digital security in a way or mm -hmm. identity security and of course you know there's a whole different topic on keeping yourself um secure and safe online but um a few years ago something interesting happened at the practice and i was taken to one side by the practice manager who wanted to have a sensitive conversation with me and said dr foster we've we've had um a letter about an unpaid debt that you uh, that, that you have um and actually you know it looks like there's a county court judgment against you and they're asking us to um deduct money from your salary, which is interesting because you don't get a salary because you're a partner, mm. uh, in order to repay this debt. Um, I said, oh, that's funny because I didn't think I had any unpaid debts. I don't really have that much debt as it stands. Um, and, um, and we investigated it, um, which took a bit of doing actually. Um, and it's because it, the, the debt had been sold on to a debt recovery agency and, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but it transpires that somebody had used um, my name and and some of my identifiable information, although they got some wrong as yeah. well, um, to take out a ten thousand pound loan, um, and uh, and and they'd um, done. So, the person was was in the area because they were able ultimately to say where this person had given as their address, but it was mm -hmm. within the practice catchment area. Um, so it, it seems somebody had used my identity or part of it in order to take out a loan not paid the loan and then that caused um issues for me in terms of um having to work all of this out and make sure that my own credit rating wasn't impacted so as uh, it's interesting so i think just be careful that not all um issues and problems are in the physical world as well mm -hmm. uh, just got me think about you know what what information we have about ourselves online that people can triangulate um, you know, obviously, we have some information about ourselves on practice websites and other areas of social media, and I'm sure we could do a whole different podcast about keeping ourselves safe online. But I just thought that mm -hmm. that was interesting, an interesting anecdote and another angle on um, on security and safety. Absolutely, social media is a key part of that as well. So I know I've done various talks about you know um, what information you're sharing on social media platforms, being aware of what you're sharing. So photos in particular. I mean, Facebook even did a, a, a campaign about it about a year or so ago. You know, don't post photos that you know. For example, what if you have your bank details, your address in the background of the photo that people can zoom in and use and and, and that kind of stuff. And you know, even posting things like, "Hi, today's my birthday." Well, actually, you've just told yeah. everybody in the world what your birthday is. <laughs> and, uh, you it's know, three points, identifiable information, name, address and birthday. You give those out and people can potentially do some weird things with that. So, you know, just being aware of what you're sharing, how you're sharing in, in what way and that kind of stuff absolutely needs to be important. Um, so, yeah, you do seem a bit unfortunate, Andy. I must have. I do, yeah, when you start to think about these things. Gosh, lots happened. Anyway, <laughs> never mind. I take it well, I suppose. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, anyth anything else? 
to add or or shall we sum up a little bit? Uh, no, I think we've covered various different aspects. Clearly, if people do want to mention anything else, we, we are streaming live. I think we forgot to mention that this time. And um, so <laughs> if people did have any questions or stories that they wanted to share, feel free to chuck them in whilst we kind of, um, you know, uh, summarize things. But I guess a couple of things I did want to suggest people have a look at. So these were resources that I was shared with by other people through, you know, the various platforms I interface with. So there's the, the Susie Lampu organization, um, and we'll put the, the links to all of these down below in the show notes and stuff, but that they give lots of really good information about potential resources and things you can put in place to look at, you know, stuff like loan working. Um, and, you know, I guess that's the first thing I would recommend to all practices out there. Make sure you've got things like a loan worker policy. Make sure you've got things like um, security policies in your practice and, you know, um, aggressive patient policy or whatever you want to call them, you know, the, the, those conflict kind of make sure you've got those in place and that, you know, you are regularly reviewing them. I know, um, to, you know, um, to be honest, I would imagine that CQC would want to see those anyway. And whilst although we're in the, the middle of a pandemic and everything else is crazy and mental, you know, unfortunately, that's where some of these conflict kind of situations arise even more frequently. I'm, I'm sure many people out there are feeling um, a different kind of tension and, and potentially more complaints or, you know, the worst ones, obviously the vexatious ones where it's just people being wrong. Um, but it's understanding that, that that's the mood, unfortunately, right now. It, it is a little bit unpleasant because people are at the end of the tethers and, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, trying to make sure you're not getting into those dangerous situations is really important. So I guess the, the, the couple that I would recommend, uh, so one was the Susie Lampo organization. Um, I had a look at that. That's quite a good website and it's got lots of information in. And then the other one is um, one specifically about loan worker advice, and that's by the um, Health and Safety Executive. Um, uh, so it's a government website and, and stuff, and they've got some really useful information in terms of having a look at policies and what you need to think about and that kind of stuff as well. So we'll put those links down below so you can have a little look at them and things. But uh, I mean, what, what have you taken from this, Andy? You know, what kind so, of things would you do differently? I would summarize. So I think the key points are um, share and document information that enables people to make you know risk assessments in the future. Work as a team. So look out for each other, um, you know, and a whole team, you know, including the receptionists and, and, and everybody to try and keep everybody safe. Um, risk assess in the moment. Um, mitigate so does someone need to be in the room with you do you need to take someone on the visit what do you need to put in place to make that consultation safer um know how to um, get help if something goes wrong so that's your your keyboard shortcuts um you're calling for help you know all of those mm. uh, all of those things um have your uh have up to date and feel comfortable in your conflict resolution skills because um those are really really useful um, but sadly, they don't always work. So be clear as a practice what happens if something actually does get out of hand, as very rarely it can do. Um, deliver on your processes. And, um, you know, afterwards, if something does happen, big or small and upsetting, um, mm -hmm. then debrief and, you know, treat it as a significant event and uh, and learn from it as an organisation, as in, as in, as individual practitioners, I guess. Um, those are my key key take home things and yeah i think process is really key uh how about you gandy any take homes no i i definitely agree with all of that i think you know it's, it's understanding how have we got to that point why have we got to that point if is it preventable from happening again that's the the big one i think for me because unfortunately sometimes things happen but how can you try and make sure they don't happen again because what was it Einstein said doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different outcome is the definition of stupidity or, or something like that and okay, yeah. I, this is an area where you don't want to be stupid let's be honest you know you don't want to be you know hopefully I'm, I'm sure people have had a lot of near misses um but you don't want it to be the situation where something truly negative happens you know I, I remember a while back the, there was a GP that got shot by a crossbow for example by a patient um, I don't know if you remember that story, but you know, someone got stabbed as well. I think I remember a few years ago. Yeah, you know, uh, and and those are the situations we don't want to see ever happen. So, it is one of those areas where things like knowing your policies, knowing the safety protocols, you know, having a system in place can actually be very useful and, and safe. That's the key thing. It can be. Yes, I know sometimes we find they're frustrating, but they're there for a good reason and definitely know what the process is in your area and trying to make sure you've got the support if something bad was to happen to the opportunity to, to share it because 
keeping that stuff in it is the stuff that makes you feel worse isn't it absolutely so um yeah but and, and also i suppose just to end on a light note mm -hmm. generally i'm heartened by how rare these Agreed. things yeah. happen so if people are thinking about a career in general practice do not be put off these things are really really rare and actually when things do happen um it's really quite nice most of the time how actually most of the other patients and the community are actually really really supportive of their general practice and their staff mm. um, and also you know the police and other services are generally really really responsive to issues that happen in in general practice i found so um don't be too negative because you know there are there are, there are positives these things are rare and, and absolutely I, I mean i mean it's important to reflect on the fact that both between me and you we've got what 20 years worth of general practice experience yeah so we've both pretty much been working you know six seven sessions a week at least most of the time and things and you know out of that i mean i've only had two occurrences where i personally felt even close to being in a situation where it would make me concerned and i've always been able to get myself out of them it sounds like you've had about three or four maybe so yeah, I mean, similar similar yeah so you know really rare for that to happen and i guess the key thing is just making sure you're learning from them afterwards and stuff that that's the important thing absolutely good so look after yourselves and each other yeah. um and um yeah i don't really have anything else to say on that gandy should we wrap up no. I think, yeah, so clearly if you have any comments or questions, we're, we're keen to hear, hear them. We'd love to hear what people have thought about this particular episode because it's slightly different to what we you know, typically tend to do. And talking about, you know, uh, like I said, it's an often neglected and challenging area of general practice because it's talking about stuff we don't really want to talk about because we kind of hope it never happens. But if it does, like I said, it, it's worth being aware of it. And I guess as always, you should be learning here to help save you and your patient's time by taking hands to your primary care and learning. And we'll catch you in the next episode. Yeah, catch you later, guys. Bye-bye.